Welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in 2022. I've received apologies for today's meeting from Emma Harper, but she is substituted by our colleague James Dornan and he is joining us online. The first item on our agenda today is a presentation from Dr Irena Conan, who undertook commission research um, to the committee for the international, mod international models of social care for their consideration ahead of our scrutiny of the National Care Service Bill. And I invite Dr Conan to give her presentation of no more than 20 minutes and then we'll ask you some questions afterwards. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so... Okay, so hi, so I'm Dr Raina Conan, and I'm going to talk to you today about the rapid review that I did looking at comparing international models of social care. So the aims of this presentation um, are to provide an overview of the rapid literature review that I conducted um, and to outline, particularly to outline the key findings of the review. So the main features of the different models, uh, key similarities and differences between each of the models, and then also to outline some important considerations when thinking about the transferability of the models. And from this, have a look at some of the uh, evidence-informed recommendations for decision-makers. So the literature review of international models of social care. Um, so the purpose was to very much to provide a descriptive and comparative overview of the literature available and the types of evidence. So the review was structured around six particular research questions. So how social care is structured, delivered and funded and governed the benefits and limitations of each model, impacts on population health outcomes, but also as well healthcare delivery, which is also important, and looking at the enablers and barriers to the effective implementation delivery of each model, especially around integration reforms, um, what other countries have done here. And then looking at the enablers and barriers to the long-term sustainability of each model, especially the financial sustainability, and then thinking about the points that we need to consider when thinking about the transferability of the models, particularly in Scotland. So the questions that we had were answered for each of the countries, which were Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the US, Alaska, Switzerland, Canada, the Nordic countries, the EU countries, particularly focusing on Germany, the Netherlands and France, and all four of the UK countries. <laughs> So the review that we did combined systematic, narrative and Delphi method techniques to review the existing literature, and that was very much both the academic literature and the grey literature. Um, the data collection process looked at in the interdisciplinary materials available, so it covered a very broad range, and um, the findings were verified via the um, a project advisory group to verify the findings. So the final sample consisted of 166 articles and documents um, which were coded for and subject to detailed scrutiny. Okay. Now the findings, um, which is the key thing. So um, the first findings for the first question, how is social care funded, structured and governed? So we looked at these for the different countries. So as you can see here, I've got a sample of, of some of the countries too. And you know, the the key details will be available in um, the summary sheet that was given to you. So we can see the key similarities in, in delivery and mix between public and private providers in Australia and Canada, but also the differences in funding. Um, or here we can see as well um, in Japan and the EU place high levels of expectations on informal care compared to Switzerland. And we can also see we've got some similarities between the German system and the Japanese system, both being funded through compulsory social insurance schemes. But we can also see how they, they diverge in terms of their delivery. Or we have the Nordic models and New Zealand systems, which are quite similar to the UK in a number of ways, but very different in others. Um, so particularly with the extent of integration with the New Zealand system, and the amount of um, for-profit provider provision that we have compared to the Nordic countries, although this has been increasing in recent decades too. Now, what I would like to draw your attention to, 
um, is a slide here which has the key differences between the countries in terms of funding and key aspects of governance and delivery. So we've got a number of countries funded through central taxation um, or in the case of the EU through compulsory um, insurance schemes which are organised centrally. Big differences here are in the Alaskan models which are funded through um, the Alaska state's own version of Medicare. And in France, um, the social insurance scheme is funded both centrally and regionally via taxation. In Japan, its insurance scheme is funded on a regional basis. And Canada is a particularly interesting example because the arrangement is done on a provincial basis with powers transferred to the provinces via federal and central legislation. So locus of control, we can see key differences here. In Australia, it comes under federal control, but the responsibilities between federal and state aren't particularly clear, which has caused problems. And in Switzerland, although it's funded centrally, the municipals have control over governance. And in the Nordic countries, I've put largely central, because although the districts have the power to make arrangements, it's supported by strong national level legislation concerning eligibility and quality of care, which places limits on these powers. So again, it's similar to New Zealand, where regional authorities have control, but within uh, national legislative limits. For eligibility, we have a broad range and very strict conditions to broad coverage. And this is also linked to the final column of informal care, um, where the expectation is that that will plug the gap. So in Australia, we've got it determined by needs and a means-tested basis, with the expectation for informal care is low. And in Japan, the criteria is actually very strict, but the coverage is broad for those who do qualify, but it's meant to plug the gaps in informal care provision. And in the EU countries, um, it's based on legibility, <clears throat> but it, criteria has become much stricter in recent years, particularly in the Netherlands. And in these countries, there's also still a high level of expectation on informal care. And in Germany, it's in the past, it was legislated that family members you know, should contribute to the costs of care for family members. And there were higher premiums to pay for those um, without children too, which was very, very controversial. It's a, it's a very contentious issue. In Alaska and the US, it's means tested, but the service provision is very low. So what ends up happening here is that families plug the gaps regardless of any cultural expectations like in Japan to do so. And then the last bit is the integration of social care with health care, which is important as it affects the provision. In Australia, separated in the US and Alaska, um, social care isn't covered by Medicaid unless it's part of residential um, health care services or rehabilitation services. So a lot of what we have here in Scotland that comes under um, aged care and social care isn't provided for, like general assistance in the home under the system. In Canada, it comes under extended health care, um, which is broader than the US and Alaska, although the majority of care for older people is still provided in residential settings. Coverage for home care is substantially poorer. In Switzerland, they're linked in terms of service provision, but not integrated in the same way as in New Zealand or Northern Ireland. And of course, in the other UK countries, we've seen a greater move towards integration. So we also looked at the strengths and weaknesses of the different models. So with the Australian system, um, the opening of care provision to private providers has led to a lot of concerns about increasing inequalities. And the lack of integration impacts care delivery for those with very complex needs. But as I said before, we have a reduced need for informal care. In the US, the key problem overarching all the other issues are the inequalities in access to aged care and the exacerbation of social, economic and racial health inequalities. Alaska is different to the other states in that the models that were provided um, for Indigenous people are aimed at ageing in place. So a lot less emphasis um, on residential care. And there is potential for reducing inequalities in outcomes because these models are built on diversity, built upon a diversity of worldview, different conceptualizations of health and well-being. So it moves beyond simply recognizing cultural diversity towards building um, a system based upon it. But it's also primarily health focused. So the amount of social care provision still remains limited. 
Um, again, in Canada, the majority of care is provided in residential institutions and there are big differences in provincial arrangements which can create inequalities and in accesses between um, provinces. But what we have found in Canada is that some of the strict regulations they have for licensing of care home um, helps private for-profit providers meet care delivery standards. In Japan, it's very much based on a paternalistic medical model. High levels of informal care is particularly you know, concerning as a gender equality issue with um, women who are the ones who carry out the majority of care. But access to care is standardised and coverage is good if you qualify. In the EU countries, the system provides for basic levels of care only, with the rest expected to be covered by informal provision. Another downside is that single sourced insurance schemes can be vulnerable to macroeconomic fluctuations, but also contribution systems have been said to be associated with a reduced need for political bargaining, where, as in Canada, some of the short political cycles have been said to limit the effectiveness of reforms. Okay. Um, now, in Switzerland, the system ranks very well internationally. But the fragmentation of governance and delivery between the federal, um, municipal and also local authorities in terms of delivery and governance has been associated with increased risk of suboptimal quality of care. The Nordic countries, often considered best practice by international standards, provide universal coverage supported by na uh, national level legislation, which ensures equality in levels of care provided and the quality of services. Now, in the literature here, um, a lot of it will discuss how marketization has challenged the principle of universalism because there's an introduction to pay for add-on or top-up services. And the New Zealand model integration um, helps uh, meet the care needs of those with particularly complex needs. So the emphasis is on overall well-being um, and it's well integrated. And a lot of it is focused around addressing existing health and social inequalities. Okay, so the UK countries. So we have Scotland, where increasing integration has potential for a more holistic approach. But cons of this, this um, what's been happening is that health can emerge as the dominant partner. But public expectation for social care provision um, is, real, you know, is high and eligibility in Scotland is relatively high. Whereas in Northern Ireland, where we have had an integrated system for decades, the multiple layers of decision making um, and there's un unclear lines of accountability um, can mean, has meant there's been quite a, quite a few issues here too. And also care user choices can be limited. England has slightly greater reliance on for-profit providers than Scotland but here the key challenge for integration is a lack of statutory basis. And satisfaction with social care in England has also been decreasing in recent years. In Wales, the biggest concerns are over accessibility, care quality and coordination. But it has been found that pooled budgets will help facilitate data sharing and commissioning. So the answer to the third research question, which was about the impact of each system on population health outcomes, um, needs to be considered when thinking about the pros and cons of each model. So some conclusions that we can draw are that poor integration between health and social care can negatively impact those with complex needs, such as in Australia. Um, especially when we compare it to, say, Japan, where the system is positive, because although limited in terms of eligibility, it will cover a large range um, of services for those with the most complex disabilities and needs. You know, I've, uh, limited coverage in the US is very much linked with widening social economic and health in, uh, racial health inequalities. And in Alaska, where there's a bit more provision for care services for indigenous people, it's associated with greater preventative health outcomes, as well as better treatment for chronic disease and lower hospital admission rates. In Canada, differences in the provincial arrangements do result in national level inequalities in access to care and health outcomes. And the marketization of social care has, in all the all countries, been linked to growing health inequalities um, in terms of health outcomes. However, the impacts can be somewhat mitigated 
by national level legislation concerning the quality of care and the amount that providers can charge, such as seen in the Nordic countries um, and also to an extent in Switzerland. Integrated care provision is associated with better quality of life outcomes overall, which affects health outcomes and is helpful for reducing pre-existing inequalities. And in the UK, so far, there's been little evidence that attempts to increase integration has affected health outcomes to date, but the longer term effects and impacts are not really known. And it's going to take several decades before we really start to see the impact of this. Okay. So again, just have a little thought before I detail the findings to the other questions. So underpinning questions about integrated care are questions about how health um, related care relates to social care. And what I would encourage you know, to consider is how social care needs reflect health care needs or quality of life and broader well-being needs. Where's the demand now and where will it be in the future? You know, and with this in mind, think about you know, which models that you might be in favour of. In an ideal world, and obvi you know, because obviously it's maybe limited by questions about funding and ability to del deliver. But I think, you know, what we need to think about is what do you think should be coming under the rubric of social care? Is it about extended health care needs with wider well-being being part of something else, such as, you know, community? Or should broader well-being come under what you think should come under social care? So that's really the fundamental question at the base of these models. So... Um, findings with the barriers and enablers to the success of different models of integrated care. So we had a look through um, what the different countries, what they said about um, what were the successes and barriers. So in particular here was a New Zealand approach about having a clear vision of a one system, one budget really helped to achieve positive outcomes. And then in the EU countries and in Canada, Alaska and the United States, particularly in Canada, the amalgamation of the district health authorities into a single provincial health authority helped improve outcomes. And also, another important lesson we can take from this is how frameworks and standards can help facilitate successful integration. In the Nordic countries, again, um, Key lesson is that marketization can challenge quality of access, but if funded care services remain comprehensive enough that very few demands for top-up services are made, it won't impair the provision of um, universe, uh, universality. So challenges to the financial sustainability of the models. So we need to think about is how likely each of these models can be sustained. Now, all are affected and challenged by the challenges of an ageing population, which place rising demands on care. The Nordic models, while the gold standards are coming under pressure across uh, in terms of the ability to provide universal care in the future, owing to the ageing population. But another challenge in Australia and Canada, and also in the UK countries, are changing patterns of care needs. The move towards care at home you need to be able to fund and also provide the workforce for it too. But at the same time, if you take the US with its low state spending, it's coming under pressure from rising inequalities in health with people requiring care at younger ages and often for more complex needs. So reduced spending in this case, you know, is unlikely to solve the problems alone. All contribution-based systems uh, funded through central taxation are affected by economic fluctuations, so they're not completely stable. And the integrated system in New Zealand is dependent on increased spending on community care to sustain it and avoid some of the problems um, that we have seen, also recently in Scotland, where health spending has emerged as more dominant. So again, lastly, we looked at factors <clears throat> that we need to consider when thinking about transferring one social care model to a different context. So if something works, can we uplift it and implement it somewhere else? Now, from the very limited number of studies that explored actually transferring models to different contexts, we found in practice it can be very difficult. The abilities of it to succeed financially is very much dependent on the wider economy, <clears throat> so timing here is important, 
and there is a need to consider the fundamental principles that underpin a country's model of care in how it compares with a recipient country. So if we take the Nordic uh, model underpinned by the principle of universality, which is widely accepted publicly, and implement the US system, which is embedded on principles of freedom and responsibility, resistance is likely to be high and vice versa if we do the same with the Nordic model. Again, likewise, there's a strong cultural value in Japan still to provide informal care. Um, and so to implement this model with expectations in the Nordic or Australian countries, where there is a wider emphasis on supporting a dual earner model, there's likely to be a lot of resistance. So it's about thinking about the core concepts and values that underpin a model and seeing where they fit with the social, cultural values and expectations of the recipient country. But we also find other factors to consider such as the rate of population ageing in, bo in both countries. So while the Japanese system is coming under pressure from the ageing population, we need to keep in mind that its rise is much more rapid than in Scotland and other countries. So might that be more likely to be sustained here? Perhaps. Other things, population geography and governance structures. So if we take Canada, we've got a huge geographic area with differences in population dynamics in each province. And while we might say um, regional governance can add layers of complications, when you have an area as large as this and as diverse as this, there is a strong case against the one-size-fits-all model. And also, we have to think about population diversity. So you can have a universal system, which works in some contexts, or you can have a system that recognises diversity increasingly like in New Zealand, um, which is helpful for addressing existing inequalities, or a system like the Alaskan models for Indigenous people that's based on diversity in how we understand health and well-being. So, the conclusion. What can we learn from the review? So, all systems are facing pressure due to population ageing. There is not a perfect single model. Integration can help deliver more holistic approaches to care, but strategies need to be put in place to ensure care, social care does not end up in a subordinate position to that of primary health care. Increased uh, uh, profit, uh, for-profit provider provision can enhance inequalities, but it can be somewhat mitigated by higher level uh, national le legislation and ensuring that care services remain high enough um, so that demands for extra services are low. And again, particularly from a lot of the case studies in Canada, delivering savings should not be adopted as an immediate objective of integration. Um, stricter demands for eligibility risk increasing reliance on informal care and widening inequalities in health and quali um, quality of life, not just for those the care recipients, but also for those who are providing care. So from the findings, we came up with 10 recommendations for decision makers, each of um, which is available at the end of the report um, that you have too. So just to read a couple of these out to you as well, care services should be provided on a consistent basis across geographic areas to avoid geographic inequalities in terms of provision and outcomes. <clears throat> A clear one system, one budget, budget approach can reduce complexity and eligibility for access to care should remain high to prevent rising inequalities, unmet needs and increased dependency on informal care providers. Um, lesson from Northern Ireland, standardised definition of what personalisation of care would be helpful for the care user as well as for um, those responsible for delivering care. And mechanisms that address cultural differences between locally accountable um, social care services and centralised health services can help improve integration. But financial savings shouldn't be viewed as an immediate objective of integration. Budgets intended to support integrated care should not be used to offset overspends in acute care. And when thinking about facing the challenge of the ageing population, um, forward planning and significant investment are required to meet future care needs. But the challenge of the ageing population is something that is posing a challenge to the sustainability of all the models that we examined. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conan. I'll let you catch your breath.
for, for a bit. I mean, list, listening to you, to you there uh, and, and the, the point that you ended on about ageing population is, is a, a worldwide concern for, for every country. One of the other concerns for, I imagine, most countries is attracting people into the care sector. Yeah. And we are obviously facing that mm -hmm. uh, in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the objectives of, of, the, of the bill that we've got mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. is to make um, it attractive, a, a, a career, mm -hmm. parity of esteem with our health health. Mm -hmm sector yeah is that something that i mean I, I saw it mentioned when you were talking about new zealand mm -hmm. that 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 came up in new zealand model mm -hmm. because of what they've done mm -hmm. are they finding that they are having less of a problem in attracting people into the profession of care are there any of the other models that you can point to where that's actually been something that's been an out a good outcome in terms of the reforms that have been made um, yeah, um, one um, is the Nordic models, particularly within Sweden, where um, they have professional, they have standards for professional accreditation of professionals and um, for service delivery too, which has made it more attractive um, to attract people to the profession um, to do that as well. In New Zealand, yes, it is the case too about, you know, having it um, in terms of standards. But again, something um, in the wider uh, literature, which was focusing on Japan, it was around um, low wages, low payments for those involved in social care and discussing that within the idea of emotion, um, sort of the emotional labour um, side that caring social care is often very undervalued because it is assumed that caring is a natural thing that people can do without particular training. And that is something or an idea that has prevailed over the decades and mm. still influences this lack of funding um, towards social care. Um, but that is increasingly being challenged, yes, um, in New Zealand, also to some extent in Australia, and also in the Nordic countries, particularly in Sweden. And just to follow up before mm -hmm. I let my colleague come in, in terms of, I mean, that was obviously the accreditation, mm -hmm. but there's also, you mentioned, the remuneration of people yeah. working mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. in the Nordic country was mm -hmm. that something that was addressed? Yes, it as, was. As, as well. Okay. Yes. yes. Sandesh Gohani, you've got some questions yeah. on that theme. Yeah, I've just got one, Kanina. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, all the work that you've done in it. My, my question is about your methodology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to to look a little bit into that. So, um, you excluded papers that were published in languages other than English. Yes. Now, mm. that would present a problem because Japanese is obviously the dominant language for Japan yeah, yeah. and French being yeah. for France and German being for uh, Germany, and we could keep going like that. Yeah. So, so my question is, how many papers were excluded on this basis? And if you've excluded papers and how much per, um, per language, mm -hmm. and if you've excluded that many papers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how yeah. can we say that your okay. research on those particular countries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is robust? Okay. Um, first of all, the numbers are detailed in the reports. There weren't that many that we actually ended up excluding, um, which weren't in English. And these are academic articles. Now, the standard, um, there are some journal articles that are published in, say, French or German or in Japanese, but the international academic uh, the majority of the high-level, high-ranking international journals, the publications are in English. So people who are working in Japan, um, conducting high-level quality of research, publishing in the highest quality journals, um, are publishing in English. Uh, or same as in France. In Canada, um, the journal, because of um, the bilingual... Um, requirements for journals, it will be often the case that a paper will be published in English and in French, so we can access it that way too. But, um, yeah, the high, we're talking about high, high-ranking international journals, um, which contain the information that the researchers have conducted in France and in Japan and verified by international experts, um, peer reviewers. 
to be Sorry, published. So how many were excluded? I, did, I couldn't see that. Uh, in the, the exact number, it says in the report, I'm not sure, if I can't remember off the top of my head what the exact number was uh, that were excluded, but it wasn't very many, but it's detailed in the reports. Yeah. Okay. Come to Paul, and then I'll come to Gillian. Oh, no, Gillian, you mm -hmm. don't want Paul. Thank you, computer. Uh, I wonder if I could ask about um, social work in this, because uh, obviously it's challenging, I would imagine, in, in the preparation of this to try and compare like with like, because I suppose we're not in a sense, and the scope of the bill, which we will be mm -hmm. uh, scrutinising, goes beyond just that yeah. really practical delivery of social care, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Northern Ireland's perhaps a good example, because social work is delivered slightly different in differently in Northern Ireland uh, via, via more of a health board model. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder if you find any international examples where elements of social work as a profession were, were put into this kind of more national structure around around social care? Um, yes, uh, in New Zealand, also in Japan as well, um, in Australia to a certain extent, and in uh, the Nordic countries too, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just to maybe expand on that, if I can, Convener, did that involve, you know, criminal justice, children and young people services, as well as just older people's services or learning uh, disability, for example? Absolutely, particularly um, around disability services. Um, in New Zealand and in Japan, it was particularly around disability. Um, also, children's services um, came into it, criminal justice, addiction services, um, and yeah, yeah uh, um, other rehabilitation services too. Yeah. Okay. Any other colleagues want to ask a question, or else I'll just keep going because I've got a couple more questions. I'm looking to my colleagues. One of the things you mentioned, particularly talking about the the countries where there's an expectation of presumably family yeah. care. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in the countries which have a, have a lot more of a reliance, some more of a culture. Mm -hmm. Do those countries give any kind of financial support? You know, the same way that we have the carers allowance. Yeah. You know, is it is it just like a case of those families are expected just to get on without without any or is, or is it variation? There is a variation there, but largely if we're talking about the Japanese model in particular, it's very much a reliance on informal care. It's, that's the expectation mm -hmm. with the social care is to plug the gaps in informal care provision. It's round the other way there. There is, um, for carers, um, particularly in the Netherlands is a good example here, where there are allowances available for those providing informal care. Um, to help um, cover some of the costs. But again, it is extremely limited. Um, it's also means tested and it is very much, um, you could say, is, is defined as is, is a last resort. Yeah. There too. Yeah. yeah. The expectations for informal care, it is um, long standing cultural expectations that is behind this. It's um, funding is to support that rather than uh, funding being used to develop that, shall we say. And without presuming, because I don't want to presume, but certainly in this country, that expectation tends to fall to women. Yeah. Is that the case in those other countries as it, well? It is very much the case there. Um, and it is very much related um, as to um, the earner models that we have there too, whereas we have the Nordic countries in Australia, also Canada, placing um, particular emphasis on dual earner models more broadly. So, um, but then we have in the Netherlands, which is still very much, um, even now, still largely dominated by the breadwinner model in terms of how these cultural norms um, are embedded within within the systems there too. So it is very much the case that where informal care is provided in all countries, it is very much falls to women. And that does have a knock-on effect on things like other measures of, of well-being society, like a gender pay gap as well. Uh, yeah, it's linked to gender pay gap, um, also lack of um, opportunities um, for women uh, to progress, but also increasing levels of stress um, and, uh, in those who provide informal care and poorer quality of life, especially when we take Japan, for example, where people are living for longer and we will have um, people of working age who are providing care for two generations, for their parents and their grandparents as well. Um, so it's linked to 
um, lower quality of life outcomes uh, for, th for those providing informal care. Yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, can I bring in James Dornan, who's joining us online? James? Thank you, Convener. I, I, uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Doctor. That, that was very helpful. Can I, I just ask a couple of questions? One of them is around eligibility, and you seem to suggest that there's a balancing act here, that we either make the eligibility criteria higher mm -hmm. and then can give a better service, or we make it lower than the optimum uh, and get more people in it. What's your thoughts on that, and where do you see the, the balancing line, if you like? Okay, um, there is a balance there, and there's a lot of lessons, I think, to be learned from the Netherlands and also from Japan, where they set particular standards for eligibility, for qualifying, and the demand was a lot higher than anticipated, so they had to increase um, the criteria to be able to access care. Um, that was very much the case in the Netherlands, and even increasing it, they had long waiting lists, and there were gaps in terms of care provision. And in Japan, what they did, um, what they have done is, um, where demand was higher than what they expected, they upped the level of criteria. Um, and there is a balancing act there, but the difficulty is, is that if you um, cover only a very basic level of care um, that's fun you know it's funded through a system and you have people who are then paying for additional top-up services that leads you know has been associated with rising inequalities and in well-being um, in terms of access to care but also increasing health inequalities more broadly too so there is a balancing act so my recommendation would be that the eligibility um, would need to be fairly fairly broad rather than too strict so that people a lot of people can qualify and that a lot of services can be provided to reduce that reliance on informal care and ensure that um, there's as few inequalities in terms of access and care as, as there can be yeah so a good answer, but I think it would be quite a difficult balance to achieve Absolutely. Uh, yeah. when it comes to practicalities of it. Yeah. Can I ask just one more question, Kavira? Of course. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, in Findings 3, you talk about, for the UK countries, increasing integration has a relatively limited effect on reducing existing health inequalities to date, and I mean, that's pretty clear. But can I ask, do you think that's a, a, a case of um, different systems across the UK, to some extent, the different funding or, or lack of funding going into it, or is it just a case of, for example, in Scotland, it's not been running long enough? Okay, I think it's a combination of both. Um, particularly in Scotland, um, it has not been long enough. I think to really see the impact that this will have, you're talking about 15 years, a couple of decades, to be able to see that generational impact that it's actually going to have. In terms of um, in terms of its effectiveness, but also um, the lack of if you compare um, satisfaction some of the outcomes in Scotland and England, um, the lack of funding for social care is a problem too. And also, I think um, another reason um, is that it's there have been teething problems so far with um, health emerging as a more dominant partner. There have been issues so far, and. I think that needs to be addressed before the system can really reduce a lot of the inequalities um, because there are quite you know underlying health inequalities in Scotland, which an integrated system has the potential to reduce if um, if we get it right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Convener, yes. if you have time, can I ask one more question? Yes. It's just a, a small question. Uh, it's about informal care expectations. Mm -hmm. How did you get to figure out how you see low, high, mixed, etc.? Because in the UK countries, you say it's low, which mm -hmm. means that I'm taking it that it means that there's not an expectation that your family will be looking after you, right? Mm -hmm. But we all know of cases where families are, are looking after yep. people. 
Um, yeah, we all know of cases, and um, I'm sure many people here, um, many people will be providing care for older people, but um, the system is set up in a way that anyone who needs care um, should be able to access it. It's based primarily on need, not who you know, who you have supporting you to do so, whereas if you go to a system um, in Japan or in the Netherlands, they will ask, who provides care? Who do you know? Who are your family? Um, that will be included in your care needs assessment in that in that way. Um, the expectation is that there is no... While informal care is provided, um, people who have the need um, for care to access these services are able to do so. Yeah. Thanks very much for that. Okay. Um, I'm Sandesh has a quick question, then I'm going to come to Tess White. So just recognising Tess online that I have seen that you want to come in. Sandesh first, and then we'll go to Tess. Thank you, Kimina. Um, I'd like to just ask you about something that you said towards the end of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of your concluding remarks about Canada. Um, and you said there's a strong argument against a one-size-fits-all model based in Canada due to the geographical yeah. mm -hmm. um, variation. Um, and you know, I feel that Scotland has significant geographical variation. So yeah. how does that statement fit with um, recommendation one mm -hmm. and recommendation um, three? Um, which So one is about... Um, Mm -hmm. uh, care services being provided on a consistent basis yeah. and three being mm -hmm. a clear one system one budget approach mm -hmm. to, to the comment that you made about mm -hmm. Canada. Okay. Um, yep. In Canada, because Canada spread over such a large geographic uh, landmass and there are various differences in terms of transport accessibility between the provinces, the territories and the north, um, <clears throat> big mix between remote, very, very remote rural areas large distance to you know high density urban areas too and um high indigenous population with a lot of health inequalities there too and on that basis an argument against the one size fits all model and the evidence in canada where they have had various projects in all the different provinces to try to integrate um uh, health and social care more have said that by amalgamating at the local level within the provinces has worked. So having centralised centralisation in the provinces has worked, but not across the different provinces because um, the needs are very diverse. Yet in Scotland, um, because that's the, in Canada we're talking about the geographic diversity, but if we have high geographic diversity over a smaller space, like in Scotland we have the highlands and islands, remote areas, and also high density urban areas, you know, we do have um, a particular mix as well, which we would need to consider, you know, would a one-size model work here or not? Now, in New Zealand, it's about having a clear one system, one budget. That's very much about funding <clears throat> funding and delivery um, being controlled more centrally, um, tied together. But at the same time, you also need to tailor approaches to a particular place, and that's something that Wales was looking at as well, um, to ensure that care needs, particularly in a lot of the remote areas, people have equal access to care, where there can be difficulties you know, finding the workforce to be able to do it. But rather than having different budgets um, or different ways, different ways of governing, um, like in, in Switzerland, where you have three levels of governance and different provinces that can raise problems. It's tying together the governance mechanisms, centralising it, but still allowing enough flexibility to be able um, to provide for geographic differences, population diversity within that region. Yeah. I'll bring in Can you hear me? Can. I mean, just I think it's an, ex an excellent piece of work, Dr. Conan, uh, what you've done, a very complex piece of work. Can I just ask one question um, in terms of funding models? And mm -hmm. I think it was Japan. So you talk about differentiating healthcare from social care. Yeah. It, in the in the Japanese model or other models, mm -hmm. are there salary deductions from a certain age for health? and social care separately? Is it just Japan, 
or are there other countries such as Singapore or that you know of? Thank you. Okay. Uh, in Japan, it's uh, um, the deductions for the social insurance scheme. It is separate to the health insurance scheme. So the funding, same as in the Netherlands, um, which also has the social insurance scheme separate, and in Germany as well. So um, these are uh, funded through contributions at a certain age. In Japan, the level, there's a level of one level of contribution is made when a person reaches a certain age, but there's also a lower level of contribution um, starting at an early age. And at one point, it was proposed that this should be lowered again, um, but there was resistance to that. Um, to that too, but yeah, the um, contribution systems are separate to the com they're compulsory, but they are separate to the health uh, social insurance scheme. Um, and thank you. So it's Japan that's mainly the model there, and you say Germany and the Netherlands. I would say um, Japan and the Netherlands are the two big models there about um, Germany too, to an extent. But if you're looking for the clarity over um, how it's funded and what the barriers are to the funding, I would suggest looking at the Netherlands and Japan. Thank you. And sorry, just a quick one. In terms of percentage differential, mm -hmm. is, would you actually say that, let's say, health care is, that the, the social care is 50% deductions of health care, or is it difficult to say? Is it is it on par deductions from salary equivalent? Uh, it's difficult to say, but um, it has previously been very unequal. Um, it is it, uh, To begin with, it was very unequal, although um, salary deductions now are, in Japan, I think they're slightly lower than for health, but it, they are, they are standardised um, in Japan. Yeah. Okay, we have Thank two, two members with, with late bids for questions, but I'm only going to be able to take two other questions because we are running out of time. If I can go to Carol first and then Stephanie and we'll need to wrap up. Hi, thanks Hi. so much for your time. Um, I'm interested in two things. Um, and I know they're big things, but just to <laughs> quickly, um, I'm interested in the reporting of the quality of care that you get as an individual and you feel as a family. And I'm also interested in the the staff that provide that care and the kind of quality. And, and linking those two together, I'm interested to know, you know about local accountability in healthcare. We talk a lot about the closer the decisions are made to that person, the better the outcomes. And I just wondered if there was any sense of that in any of the models closer um you mean the closer to the sort of accountability uh -huh. and the sort of setting up of services and the managing of services whether any of the, these models reported on that yes um yes they did um particularly again in northern ireland in particular okay. um that uh particularly around northern ireland with the idea of personalization in care that a lot of people didn't really know what it meant and that people were, older people themselves who were relying on care, were more, anything, something that was new, they were uh, more reluctant to engage with, um, particularly, you know, uh, terminology as well. In the Nordic countries um, and in the Netherlands as well, where the standards, um, increasing standards of care having these uh, frameworks for accountability, same in Canada, where there were frameworks for accountability for carers, um, were associated with more positive outcomes. But a particular challenge, something that was reported heavily on in the Australian literature, was high level of staff turnover, particularly due to low wages, um, which um, has an impact on the quality of life um, for the person receiving care. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, convener. Um, but we're very much focused on wellbeing, and it, mm -hmm. it seemed to be something like the data across all the mm -hmm. countries seemed mm -hmm. to be something that everybody kind of struggled with, was measuring yeah. their success. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's anywhere in particular that kind of stands out as, as doing some good work around that, that we should maybe be taking a look at and incorporating into what we're doing. Thanks. Around wellbeing in particular? Yes. OK, um, the New Zealand model because it is focused on well-being. It's departed from, we have healthcare on one hand, social care on the other hand, we have well-being, the New Zealand model, and the Alaskan models, um, which are models um, for improving care for Indigenous people, 
but they're <clears throat> founded on indigenous um, worldviews um, and their ideas about health and well-being. So they're more focused on well-being without the separation between health, um, physical health. <clears throat> they don't have the same separation between we think of in terms of physical health or mental health. They have this idea of um, of well-being too. So the Alaskan indigenous models and the New Zealand models are the ones that are focused on well-being. In Japan, it's very much the opposite, where we have a very medical uh, model of health that is dominating um, the social care eligibility criteria. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Conan for the power of work she's put into this report and for spending so much time with us this morning and answering our questions. And it's been a very useful start to our, our scrutiny. So we're going to take a 10 minute break to allow our mm -hmm. panel to, to change over. Thank you, Dr. Conan. Okay. Thank you.
Welcome back. The second item on our agenda is our first evidence session on the National Care Service Scotland Bill. And um, we will run through who we have on our panel, starting with those in the room. Um, I welcome to the committee Sir Harry Burns, uh, the Professor of Practice and Special Advisor at the University of Strathclyde, and Nick Kemp, the convener of the Care Reform Group, group of the Commonweal. And online we have... Uh, Professor John Glasby, Professor of Health and Social Care at the University of Birmingham. Professor Catherine Hennessy, the Professor of Ageing at the University of Stirling. And Professor Catherine Needham, Professor of Public Policy and Public Management at the University of Birmingham and the ESCR Centre for Care. So welcome to you all this morning. Now, I'm, I'm going to, I suppose, go round... Um, everyone to get their, their initial thoughts on the, the bill before us. I've just m maybe mentioned to colleagues, though, um, we will not have time for every single person to answer every single question. So if my colleagues can maybe direct their questions to individuals, as in, like, don't follow my lead, or else we will quickly run out of time and not get through all of our, our themes. But... Uh, I'd like to go around the, the committee and just ask this sort of key high-level question of the National Care Service Bill that's before us. Do you think that this framework bill adequately meets the objectives of having better health outcomes for, th for those uh, there's the potential for better health outcomes for those receiving care. And I guess with an add add on of families that uh, need assistance with care uh, uh, of a family member. Um, and I'll go first of all to our, I think I'll, I'll take our online contributors first. And I'll go to Professor Hennessy first. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, in in conception, uh, I, I would say yes, and and very much um, underlining what Doctor um, Lynn said in respect to her review of the evidence about systems that provide a kind of overarching integrative structure uh, and, um, and lines of accountability and um, mechanisms for financial integration, uh, quality assurance, performance review, and uh, and service delivery. Um, what, what I think would strengthen the bill, actually, and, and I'm, uh, I'm not about changing the language of it as it is, but somewhere in there, I think what could be made uh, stronger is an explicit statement of a life course approach to health. Because essentially, I don't mean, I read through the whole policy document that accompanied the bill, um, uh, it, it went step by step through the various parts of the system that were going to be tied together and joined up. But I think um, a stronger sense of the fact that, you know, the risks, risks to health are accrued and protections for health are conferred right along the life course. So, you know, from in utero, really, uh, through to, um, to late old age, all these, all these risks and protections are joined up. And, and, and that would really, I think, uh, provide, um, uh, a kind of un underpinning for the ration uh, the rationale for what the bill is proposing. But I think, in essence, to answer your question, 
uh, in essence, what Dr. Conan was emphasizing about um, a kind of overarching um, inter integrative structure accompanied by um, the ability to be flexible at a local level and to tailor services and, and provision at a local level are, are definitely within the bill. Thank you. Can I go to Professor Needham next, please? Thank you. Um, well, I guess my question uh, or my kind of understanding of the bill is that uh, improving health outcomes isn't necessarily the measure of success that where well, we know that, that this has worked, that um, kinds of things that, uh, that the bill is trying to achieve is realization of human rights, supporting people to thrive, uh, ensuring communities that prosper. And so health outcomes, of course, will be a part of that, but it's located within that much bigger well-being piece. Um, and I think the kind of the, the key question to be asking around that then is, what's the theory of change here? Why would centralizing accountability and creating new care boards achieve those goals around thriving and well-being? The research, our Four Nations uh, comparative research that we've done looking at the Four Nations over the last 20 years in the UK, found that we've had a series of disappointing pieces of legislation that haven't achieved their goals, despite being really strong, well-supported, well-grounded pieces of legislation. So that would include the Self-Directed Support Act uh, in Scotland, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act in Wales, the Care Act in, in England. So I think it's about how do we learn from what's, what's not worked so well in the past around kind of the implementation of good legislation. And I guess I would say around that, there's maybe uh, a few things to think about would be to pay more attention to the policy mix so the interaction between different parts of the policy. So, for example, self-directed support may not sit very well with integration. That's That's been some of the, the learning from Scotland. Um, we need to think about whether centralization, what kind of message centralization sends. There's a risk, I think it sends uh, a kind of low trust message to the rest of the system, the kind of spirit of, well, I might as well do it myself kind of, of message of, I can't trust other parts of the system to get this right. And I think that's problematic. Um, so I think it's about how we see this not about getting more care packages in place, it's about the culture change that's needed and, and what some of the kind of uh, who we need in the system and what kind of structures will really build that culture change. Yeah, and that should maybe clarify, I, I, I do mean health and well-being. I, 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 did, I did miss out well-being, but I did, in my head, that's what I mean. I'm not just talking about health outcomes, I'm talking about the general well-being outcomes as well. Um, can I go to uh, Professor John Glasby? Thank you, yes. Um, looking in from a, from a different health and social care system, our experience over time and our, our experience of the evidence is that when there's a, a major national change or a major structural change, uh, the risk is that that uh, structural change can become a, an end in itself in the short term rather than just a means to an end. So um, it can distract attention from um, improving services on the front line. It can increase uh, a sense of a lack of role clarity and can harm morale uh, locally. And if you manage it well, in our experience, it can take 18 months to two years after the change in order to get back to roughly where you were before. Um, so there's something about planning for the long term, recognising that some things may get worse rather than, than better in the short term as changes work through. Uh, being clear, as Catherine said, about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and being clear that uh, this way of designing, this way of reforming is the best way of trying to deliver those kind of outcomes and that the um, things getting worse before they get back to where they were before and then hopefully getting better in the future uh, period is, is worth it for the uh, the outcomes that you're striving to uh, achieve. Uh, I think the second thing we often see around health and social care integration is that it's very easy for a, a more medical and acute-led model uh, to dominate um, social care and well-being uh, priorities. Um, how you would run specialist health services is potentially very different from the kind of care and support that people might need in their own home and in the community to lead chosen lifestyles and trying to do both at the same time with equal focus on health and on social care. 
has proved difficult, um, not impossible, but the medical and the acute um, often dominates, particularly in a, in a crisis. Um, and then thirdly, there's quite a famous article on the five laws of integration, uh, one of which is that your integration is my fragmentation. Whenever we change our boundaries, we, we inevitably create new boundaries elsewhere. So there's always something that you gain and something that you potentially have to work harder at to maintain. And as I understand it here, just as an example, there are still some answered, unanswered questions being worked through about the relationships with um, children's and adults safeguarding uh, around the relationship with children's services more generally, around the relationship with justice, uh, as an example. So uh, a set of organisational changes that, that, that make, that on paper should make some relationships easier, could also make other relationships harder. So, so there's some pros and cons to weigh up in the design. Thank you. And I'll come to our, our colleagues that are in the room. I forgot to Sir Harley Burns, first of all. Yeah, I would like to emphasise uh, some of the points that were made there. And earlier on, we talked a bit about well-being and so on. And that, that really is what I have. Since I gave up being a surgeon, I, which was a great many years ago, uh, I have focused on how we create well-being in our society. Operating on people in the East End of Glasgow made me very much aware of the fact that what they did not need was more surgery, what they needed was more well-being. And what worries me about this bill, as it worries me about any bill that comes forward for, that affects the health service and so on, is that it will be very top-down that it will have targets and indicators and all that kind of thing to go along with it. There's no question that the way in which you get effective change happening is to ask frontline staff what's needed, give them capacity to make things happen themselves. And this question of, um, of well-being in people I've looked at lots and lots of projects, international projects all over the world, not necessarily on social care, but in terms of improving well-being. And the critical thing is not telling people what they need to do, but asking them, asking them what matters to them, you know, and then helping them achieve that. And in doing that, they feel empowered and they begin to make changes in other aspects of their lives. So. A critical part of this, I think, is that engagement with the individual who is in social care. And I feel very strongly about the social care of young people. Um, children taken into care have been taken into care because they have had very bad experiences. And those bad experiences we know will have profound effects on them throughout their lives and they will end up, many of them, in, in jail, in hospital and so on. Uh, recently, in association with a colleague in Wales who recently published a paper um, in which he calculated the cost of adverse childhood experiences in 28 different countries. He did, didn't include Scotland in that, but using his method, adverse childhood experiences in Scotland cost the Scottish economy 5.4 billion pounds a year because those children experiencing chaotic um, upbringing end up in care, they end up in jail often, they don't do well at school, they often don't attend school, they don't get jobs, they never pay taxes and so on. So if you add all of that together, it's a huge burden on, on the Scottish economy. So we need to be thinking about care not as a system that we impose on the population, but, and I accept that we, we're going to have to have some kind of regulatory um, framework and so on for it, but we have to empower frontline staff to support the people that they are caring for and asking them what they need, what matters to them, how can I help you make a change uh, to your lives. Um, so that theory of change, Scotland has already done this through the Early Years Collaborative, the Patient Safety Programme and all that kind of thing. What do you want to change? By how much? By when? 
and by what method. Collect the data, and this, this is another point that is very important to me, the data has to be collected. The general data protection regulations get in the way of all sorts of important data being collected. Um, you know, I embarked on a project in which I asked community nurses which families they were caring for, that they were worried about. We then asked the local A&E department, you know, do you recognise any of these names? Yes. We asked the local police, community policeman, you know, yeah, I recognise all of them. And then you went to the NHS and you said, well, how often are you treating these people? And he said, oh, we can't tell you that. So it gets in the way of identifying people who need care, who need support. And, you know, we should build into this some kind of system of data collection that shows just how well people are responding to the care that they're getting. So I should stop there. And But it's, I think it's a really important. It's central to creating enhanced well-being across Scotland. But it's got to be done in a way that allows frontline staff to shape what what is delivered and not be imposed from the top down. Thank you. And can I come to Nick Kemp? Thank you. You've asked a very general question, and my initial response and our response, we set out a vision for a, a, a national care service and caring for all, which I hope has been sent around all MSPs. Um, but that partly came out of the COVID crisis. And if you ask me whether this bill will solve all the uh, deficiencies in the care system that were created by the... I know, right? I appreciate that, but I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet. I'm saying, does it provide the framework okay. for potentially... Well, but would improve? it provide the framework for dealing with a similar crisis? I would say no. And wh where I think we need to start, and the big lack, and to pick up what Sir Harry said, is about care. There is no definition of care. There wasn't a definition of care in the Feely Review. Now, care is integral to our lives, Right? And it's, it's a reciprocal, relationship-based thing which underpins the whole of society. It runs from the very smallest of things, like the way we acknowledge or say hello each day, all the way to how children are brought up. Care is fundamental for us to developing into adults and so on. So it is very, very important. It's what holds society together. But the other thing that happens with care is it goes wrong. Right? And it goes wrong, and this is everything from the tiny things, we all have our off days, through to systems where parents, under various pressures, it's influenced by social things, right, can't cope with their children, so children get harmed and they suffer. And it goes through to a position where people actually just stop caring for each other at all and everyone starts going out for themselves. So care is absolutely fundamental to what we do. And I think that has big implications for the National Care Service and the National Care Service Bill because it's, in, because it's integral to everyday life. It's got implications about it isn't actually something that you can uh, necessarily decide from the top. And I would support what Sir Harry says about it needs to be focused, it needs to be bottom up rather than top down. So that's one thing about the bill. Where we would say where very good thing about the bill, which are absolutely behind, we haven't mentioned, is there is central government funding. Um, this was, if you like, it's the failing in the 1940s uh, five Labour government and so on, and setting up a welfare state, was care was always left on one side, it was left discretionary compared to health service. Health service need was to come before a source, and we need absolutely the same for care. And actually, the bill does give the potential for that. Um, but what it lacks at the moment is there is no mechanism to create data on unmet need. So in order to decide what finance is needed for a care service, we need to, what needs to be added to the bill is some mechanism uh, uh, to measure unmet need. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass over to my colleague, uh, Tess White. Tess. Thank you, convener. Um, my question is, please, to um, um, in terms of is to Professor Kemp. So, in relation to care, 
Um, this is about quality versus. So during the consultation, um, Aberdeen City Council said that whilst the bill may improve consistency of services, it wouldn't necessarily necessarily improve quality of care. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm not a professor. I think I'm the only person here who's not a professor. Um, uh, in terms of uh, quality of care, I think the, the, the absolute vital thing is that uh, quality of care depends on the relationships. It depends on relationships between the staff, both social workers who are organising care and care staff. They need to have time to have relationships with the people they're caring for. The problem with the current... And that comes us to resource because the problem with the current system and we've got a lot of time and task based commissioning where home helps and so on have to be in into houses really rushed staff in care homes and so on don't have time to care for people and that leads to huge frustrations it doesn't lead to good relationships and that i would say is the single biggest thing that would make a big difference to the quality of care and for that to happen and it comes back you need to devolve decision making to the front line the front line staff need to be able to negotiate those relationships as i've said care goes wrong right uh, relationships can be very difficult if you're working with a very um, i'm a social worker if you were uh, working with a, a very disturbed child or whatever i mean the relationship's very difficult right they're not going to necessarily like you to begin with you've got to hang in there it's very very difficult working with someone with dementia right who keeps repeating the same thing a hundred times to have the patience to deal with that and to try and get through to them and form that relationship is extremely challenging so we need to resource staff to do that and that also means because of the challenging side we need to have a comprehensive training program for staff what shocks me at the moment you can walk into a care job and be going sent to somebody's house to work with someone with challenging behaviour and you've had no training, no preparation, no understanding about what their health problems or whatever might be causing them to act in the way they are. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Um, Sandy, she wanted to come in on this. Yes, thank you. Um, so my question is for Sir Harry. Um, you were speaking about data and one of the things I'm very frustrated by is, is, the, is data or the lack of it. And what I feel we should have is we need to find out what we have now to find the data. Then we need to identify the change you're going to make and what change you'd see in the data and then robustly collect the data. And I know that you said you're going to stop there, but I'd like to hear a bit more about this. So I've spoken to people in all sorts of different sectors, you know, social housing sector where um, they have data on windows that get broken and doors that get kicked in and so on. And when I speak to the education folk and ask them, well, do children from these homes attend school or whatever? Oh, we can't tell you that, you know, this kind of thing. Um, the health service, do young people from that home, how many of them attend a &E with drugs, overdoses or alcohol or whatever? All of this data, which we hold in different silos, brought together could form a picture of families that are desperately in need of support, and particularly the children in those families who are the, the problem of the future. Um, we could do it. But it's very, very difficult to, you know, when I spoke to a group of educational psychologists and said, have you got data on what kids get excluded from school? They said, uh, well, we collect the data. Well, where is it? We don't know. We're not allowed to put it on the computer. So where is it? It's probably in a cardboard box below someone's desk, you know. You know, this is dreadful. We could bring this data together. Um, we could identify individuals who need support and particularly their children and we could make a huge difference to outcomes. And I, speaking to this colleague in Wales who'd done the, the financial calculations, um, why don't we go back five years, look at the data as it was in five years ago, then look at those families now and see if things have changed, go and ask them what changed. 
what made you better and then scale that up. I, a couple of years ago, I was president of the British Medical Association and I, ha I say something to add that that's not a political position. I wasn't allowed to be involved in BMA politics. But what they did was they allowed me to ask questions to, of, of doctors. So I asked primary care doctors across the UK, what project have you seen that has transformed the well-being of families that you're dealing with? And I've collected 30, 40 different projects. So if we were to start testing some of these and following that data, we would transform it and we would reduce demand on the care system. My worry is that if we don't do this, we're going to create a care system, just like we did with the NHS, that, you know, purchaser provider and so on, and targets and indicators and so on. At the moment, the NHS has run off its feet trying to catch up with the problems associated with COVID and waiting times and all that kind of stuff because the targets are there. They're petrified at failing on the targets. If we were able to change the way that frontline staff were able to deal with patients, we would get better outcomes. So it's, there's, it's partly about empowering frontline staff, but having the data that lets them see that what they are doing is making a positive difference in their communities and scaling that up. And we transform our society. Thank you. Can I bring in James Dornan? The, I agree with everything you've said. Data is the important issue here. We need to collate it so that we know what it is we're facing and how we can improve it. But one of the things we must be fighting against is we saw in the named person legislation that people are very unwilling for others to get the necessary data that, that's required. How do we overcome that? If, if we, and you know, I'm not saying we need the data just for the sake of having the data. We need the data to help people to identify the individuals in need of support. And if we can do it in a, that very supportive fashion, implement the change, people will see that their society is improving. They will see that there's less, you know, less social problems in their communities and younger people are doing better at school. They'll leave school with qualifications, they'll get jobs and so on. And all of that kind of thing will make society better. We're not looking at data in order to blame folk. We're looking at data in order to, to support them and give them better lives. The critical thing, I mean, I, I vividly remember one man whose story made me decide to leave surgery and go into public health. And he was a man who had, who was in for the third or fourth time with acute pancreatitis, which was caused by alcohol. And I said to him, if you keep on drinking, you're going to die. And the response was, I know, I'm not stupid, but life is really rubbish. And the only pleasure I've got is the booze, so I'm going to keep on drinking. And I realised, you know, we can't, it's morally unacceptable to me to sit and let that man suffer like that. So that should, that should be the case for all of us. Yeah. And you identify individuals like that and support them. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Convene, you don't mind me coming back in. And, I, and I, I agree completely. But that was what the previous legislation was meant to be about. And the opposition towards that was so great that we couldn't move forward. Because you're right, without that, you can't help that man. Without that information, you can't help people like that man. The, the thing is... Five billion pounds a year, no matter where you are on the spectrum, the political spectrum, five billion pounds a year that could be saved. What's not to like? Okay, thank you. And we have Professor Hennessy wants to come in on this before we move on to talking about definitions of care. If I can bring in Professor Hennessy. Yes, and this relates to um, Sir Harry's point about data. 
Uh, and I just wanted to give an example of the importance, I think, of, of collecting the right data and, and um, in relation to the kind of outcomes that we, that we wish to see. Um, back in the 1970s and, and 80s in the United States, there was huge government investment in um, alternative models of long-term care provision for older people. There were 30 um, federally and state-funded long-term care demonstration experiments. And uh, I did a review of, of the kind of core 13 of these. Um, looking at, for example, what, what their aims were, what the outcomes were, and uh, in particular, what kind of data they collected on, on outcomes. All these experiments, uh, and some of which were national, uh, so covered uh, a huge number of states, and as I said, represented a, a huge in investment uh, in federal spending, um, had as their primary aim to keep um, frail older people out of residential care, out of nursing homes, and, and to keep them in the community with uh, support services, um, typically under case management um, schemes. What, what, the, what the evidence across all these projects showed was, in fact, um, these project, these models of care provision cost as much or slightly more than institutional um, nursing home care. Uh, and, but what, where the real benefits were shown were in terms of uh, increases in well-being and health-related quality of life for, for the participants, and also in family caregiver satisfaction. But when I looked at what the, across these um, couple of dozen projects, what actually was measured, um, where the projects are showed their greatest impact, so well-being, and also in family care satisfaction, not only some of the projects even measured those things. So going back to, um, Going back to Dr. Conan's point, I think number nine about initially not being so fixated on financial savings, I think that's a real point to make uh, because the real benefits of these uh, projects were realized in in other domains as well. Um, so, yeah, that's essentially what I wanted to say. So. Yep. Collecting the, you know, understanding what outcomes we're going for and also what data is relevant to that and making sure that data collection is not governed by the kind of law of the, the easily measurable. Okay, thank you. Um, move on to talking about definitions of care questions led by David Torrance. If other colleagues want to come in, just let me know. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, in our number of submissions, they raised issues on how care should be defined. For example, where does health care end and social care begin? Um, so how, what's, how would the panel members define social care and support? And I'll go to Sahari Burns first. Ask people what they need and help them achieve that, whether that be in health or social care or wherever. Um, you know, give you an example of a very significant project that I saw that took place in the south of England where a community, community in Falmouth, um, where the, all the men lost their jobs when the naval dockyard closed and that place turned into a war zone, literally firebombing and gang fighting and so on. Two health visitors turned it around uh, after a really nasty incident. They 
put letters through 50 doors inviting local residents to come to a meeting. Five people turned up and they said, what would make a difference? Uh, the place looks a tip. Let's tidy up the gardens and paint the houses. And they did that. Five years later, the whole place was completely transformed. The people, uh, employment went up something like 70% and all that kind of thing. Um, health improved dramatically. So I don't think you can define health or social care or whatever. It's so interrelated. It's what people, what you can do to people that gives them a sense of self-esteem and a sense of self-worth and self-control. That's, that's the thing that's important. David? Um, I'm just wondering if any other panel members would like to come in. It's if any other panel members want to come in uh, who are online, you just have to put a, an R in the chat box, and there we go. So I think that's um, Professor, is that Professor Needham? I maybe should let, let people know that I'm seeing Professor Catherine, and we have two Professor Catherines. So if I do mix the two of you up, I do apologise, it's just not coming up. But I think it's Professor Needham. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember the, the point in the Feely report about social care being the means to an end and not an end in itself. Um, there's a definition that the social movement, social care future use, which I really like, which is that we all want to live in a place we call home with people we love in communities where we look out for one another, doing the things that matter to us. And I think that's absolutely what, what it's about. I, I really agree with Sir Harry about the only way to know that is to ask people and let people they produce and design the supports that they want, um, but only some of that will be about health. A lot of that will be about people's housing, their education, their employment, their, their broader relationships. So I think it's that much more expansive uh, definition for me. And can I bring in Professor Glasby? Uh, yes, I was going to say exactly the same as Catherine with the social care future definition for, for me. Uh, the aim of a social care system is, is to ensure that frail and disabled people have the same choice and control over their lives as, as non-disabled uh, people. I run the UK-wide um, evidence centre called IMPACT, uh, and um, our mission or our sort of um, our belief is that good care isn't just about services; it's about having a having a life, and that plays out in terms of. Um, the ethos of, of care and support, uh, but it also links to the previous question about uh, about data and about um, setting outcomes and monitoring uh, outcomes. And a number of years ago, I've been involved in evaluating um, a mental health collaborative program in, in England where uh, mental health services would come together and set a series of improvement targets and then challenge and support each other to try and deliver those targets. And I was rung up shortly afterwards by uh, by another nation. It wasn't um, it wasn't Scotland to say that they were thinking of doing something similar. And did we have any advice? And the improvement target that they were thinking of setting was increasing the percentage of people who had a signed copy of their care plan from twenty percent to thirty five percent, and something like that. And did we think that was a good target to set? And I remember trying to say, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, everybody should have had a signed copy of their care plan since we introduced these reforms in the 1990s. So I'm mean, leaving that aside. Um, if I had a choice between having a signed copy of my care plan and not having a signed copy, I'd probably want a signed copy. And I get that having a signed copy of your care plan is, um, is indicative of a broader um, uh, cultural change with uh, and set of relationships within services. Uh, but I remember saying most of the people with mental health problems that I've spent time with say that they want three things. Uh, they want to live somewhere of their choosing. Uh, they want a job that they enjoy and they want more friends than they've currently got. Why don't you run this nationwide collaborative program uh, and set as the three uh, aspirations, uh, people living somewhere that they like, uh, people who like their jobs uh, and the number of friends that people say they have. And there was dead silence at the other end of the phone for what felt like an age before the person said, do you know what, I'm not sure Nation X is quite ready for that yet. Um, and so I think there's something really important about the definition that we adopt, but then the outcomes that we try to support people to, to achieve. And those have to be self-directed if people are going to have the same kind of choice and control over their lives. 
as non-disabled people. Um, and the difficulty with some of the service structures that we create around that is that some of our other public services um, aren't really set up to try and deliver those kind of aspirations for people's lives. So it becomes quite difficult to join uh, services up culturally uh, because of a, a lack of fit in terms of desired outcomes. And uh, I don't know if it, uh, Nick Kemp wants to come in. Okay. I've said a little bit about what the definition of care, but just following from that, and there's a huge overlap with health, but there are different knowledge and practices required for health as compared to care. To care. I mean, health is more science-based, and it var you know, varies, but it is more science-based. Um, uh, whereas care is actually an understanding about that and making care work is about relationships and so on. So there's completely different practices there. And staff, and in the middle of it, there are people like GPs who actually end up doing a lot, probably what social workers should be doing if they were allowed. They do that sort of relationship work based with people. So I'm not trying to say there are two totally different systems, but I think you need to recognise that people are bringing and the professionals involved in it and the care staff are expected to do different tasks and, bring, and therefore require different training and so on. So um, uh, it, it is, it's, it's important to see a distinction between care and health, whatever the overlap. David. I don't disagree with what uh, Nick just said, but... The health bit of it, yes, there's a science to health and well-being and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, simply telling someone who smokes that it's bad for them <laughs> is absolutely no good if they don't feel in control of their lives, if they don't feel that they want to be healthy. I mean, this, this suggestion that we put uh, calorie counts on menus in restaurants and so on, really? Does anyone believe that's going to make any change happen? It, if you feel a sense of self-esteem and a sense of control, um, then you will want to go out running in the morning and do all of these things anyway. So health, you know, as a, as a medical student and as a doctor, for a uh, practising clinician for 15 years, um, I never once heard the term salutogenesis. It was always pathogenesis, the causes of disease. Salutogenesis, Salus was the Roman goddess of well-being and safety. And it was the Scandinavians that taught me about salutogenesis. And that's what we're talking about, creating well-being. And you create well-being and you also reduce risk of ill health. So it's quite important to know that there's a crossover here. Have you got any follow-up? I have, actually. Just from the previous uh, presentation, one of the recommendations, I'm going to ask how important it is, is a standard definition of what personalisation of care means should be developed. And can I go to Professor uh, John Glasby, please? Um, so I, th I think the risk is that, that, that we develop some of these concepts and they become quite complicated. And um, for me, personalisation and self-directed support are, are fundamentally simple. They're about having choice and control over your care and support so that you have more choice and control over your life. And they're about trying to get decisions that really matter to people uh, made as close as possible to the person that those decisions affect. Ideally, it will be a decision by the person themselves. Or if it can't be for some reason, it will be a person that really knows them and really cares about them. Um, in that sense, it's little more than sensible delegation, as the, the architect of the personalisation agenda in England, Simon Duffy, once once described it. Uh, so we have quite a lot of complicated concepts, uh, but actually for me this is about independent living, about choice and about control. And the risk we've seen in some parts of England, I think it's fair to say, where I live, is that we've sometimes paid lip service to those those concepts, but really allowed the old system to carry on the way it always carried on, rather than more um, more genuinely uh, rebalancing um, power imbalances, if you like, uh, and genuinely promoting choice and control. And, and again, as with integration, the, the the means has sometimes come an end, become an end in itself. So uh, if I had 400 direct payments in my council and you had 300 direct payments, I'd automatically be doing much better than you. 
irrespectively of whether either of us were actually doing anything to, to increase choice and control for disabled people in our local area. And alongside direct payments, there's 101 other things that we could and should be doing to increase choice and control. So I, I worry that we make it more complicated than it needs to be. And, and that really, these are just words for people having choice and control over their lives and, and their subsequent ability to lead chosen lifestyles. David, are you happy for me to move on? Yes. Yes. Um, we want to talk about what, I mean, a, a very key theme that came up uh, when we were hearing from Dr. Uh, Conan about the, the future uh, demand for social care and demographics and led by Gillian Mackay. Thanks, convener, and good morning to the panel. What factors need to be considered in addressing demographic changes? Not only an ageing population, but a large population of people living into very old age. The potential, as we heard from Dr Conan earlier, for people to be unpaid carers for multiple generations or for people to be carers into old age, as well as a declining birth rate. And could I go to Professor Hennessy, please? Yes, I mean, all the, all the trends that you've just mentioned will uh, are projected to be uh, exacerbated in the next in the next couple of decades, in particular. So, I mean, these are definitely things that should be uh, right in front, you know, right in the forefront of our thinking about uh, the implications of this bill and the and the impact of of this restructuring. And again, I go back to my my comments about a, you know, the kind of the kind of framework of of health across the life course that's implicit in the bill, but that, you know, what what comes out on, uh, you know, at the far end of the life course, in in later life and older age is is a product of everything that's happened before. And the kinds of supports or lack of support for individuals at all stages of life that we provide. So, um, what I see in this bill is an acknowledgement that um, inter integrating systems of of care for individuals across the various stages of life and the different kinds of needs that they have, not just for healthcare. Um, is is very much part of that thinking and will affect the kinds of kinds of outcomes that you're talking about in in terms of how we're able to deal with these trends and not just the financial impact of and not just the financial impact of um, some of these demographic changes and trends. Julian, thanks, Camina. What actions should the government take in addressing the urgent challenges presented by the workforce demographics with the workforce comprising predominantly older women who have caring responsibilities of their own? And also, in the interests of time convener, if I can, I'll combine questions and also ask um, anybody contributing to cover what they believe needs to be done to ensure caring as a career is given parity to NHS colleagues mm -hmm. as well. And could I go to Professor Glassby first, please? Yeah, so, so there are some um, major structural issues that that, 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 that affect this. Um, um, I did a session recently for the Archbishop's Commission on Reimagining Care, and I did a, an online exercise just before I went live with the Commission, um, where I looked online to see what jobs are available um, in the area of Birmingham where I live. And you could be a home carer for minimum wage, or you could be a dog walker for £15 an hour. So there are some social choices that, that we make about the things that we, we value. Um, uh, and until those change, it, it's difficult to see how um, care could become a different kind of um, career opportunity for, for people. Um, in practice, there's lots of things that we can be doing in the meantime. Um, things like direct payments and people hiring their own personal assistants potentially open up uh, different routes into to thinking about the nature and the makeup of the social care workforce. 
Uh, things like values-based recruitment uh, allow us to recruit people with the right attitudes and values rather than necessarily um, prior experience, and that might broaden uh, the pool of people um, we can recruit uh, from. Uh, the centre that I lead, Impact, will hopefully be doing some work next year on how we can um, recruit from um, uh, men to think about the nature of care work and, and, and masculinity about uh, Eighty percent of the workforce is, is female, and twenty percent of the workforce is male at, at the moment. As a rule of thumb, so because of our social attitudes around the nature of caring, we're automatically confining who we can recruit from to to, to half the population um, straight straight up. So there's something really fundamental about the, the nature of care and about masculinity. Um, but the advantages of a national system may be that we can do something in terms of pay and conditions that where there is greater parity. Um, with the NHS, I've, I've never understood why we have separate systems of pay and rates of pay um, within health and social care, um, given that people often move across those different um, boundaries in terms of their uh, their career. Um, actually, if you're a home carer working on your own in the community, in lots of different people's homes, that the complexity of the work that you're doing, um, you know, unsupervised and, and, and autonomously, is often much higher, actually, than the work that you might do as a healthcare assistant in a hospital, where you have lots of support and, and lots of supervision and lots of systems and processes and colleagues around you. So, um, so if it was me, I would take the opportunity of a, of, of a national debate about these issues to have a, a unified framework in which um, parity is, is, is built into the design. Uh, I think... Uh, Harry Burns, you wanted to come in. I saw you nodding along yeah, to Gillian's no, question. I, I agree very much with with that uh, that comment, that series of comments. Um, having seen a close relative be uh, receive home care and so on, it, the level of responsibility that they had, uh, the carers had, was very significant. And they were on their own. They didn't have other folk to help them out or, or whatever, if there was any difficult uh, issue uh, arise. And I come back to this point about asking frontline staff, what, you know, give them responsibility and support that with appropriate rates of pay. The, the, the home carers certainly seem to me to be well worth NHS rates of pay for sure. Uh, and Nick Kemp, uh, just come on the demographics. Uh, it isn't, and age is the main related, the main determinant of care, right? I suppose for the bulk of you know the biggest group of people needing care is older people, but age isn't the only determinant. Um, uh, uh, there are other factors. There are social factors in there, but as you pointed out, there's also what's happening to carers. Right, and actually, what wasn't really picked up, I think, in, in the international evidence is there's 860,000 people providing informal care in Scotland. There's 25 hours of informal care provided for every one hour of paid care. So there's a huge amount of informal care being provided. What happens to those informal carers affects the whole need for care in the care system. Right. So, and at the moment, the particular the economic and social crisis at the moment, things like uh, I mean, there are over sixties like myself. Right? We, we, you know, we're involved in doing care. Uh, you have to work till you're seventy, and you've suddenly got rid of a whole lot of those people who are doing informal care. So there's a huge amount. It's much more complicated than just demogra demographics. Um, the sec on the workforce, I totally agree about pay. The National Care Service should be an opportunity to introduce national pay and conditions. I think the government said that it wants to do that. It's just not in the bill, right? But there are two other crucial points on it. One is training. The training is a may in the bill. It's not a must. We can't have a workforce that's not trained properly. It has to be must. But the last thing that no one's picked up at the moment is... It is a demanding job, as I've said, because you're often you're working in very difficult circumstances. Harry's picked up. So workers need time for support. Right? That means peer support. We have lots of home helps at the moment who work out of the back of the car, being ordered to go to places right, by someone on a remote app. 
they never get a chance to talk to colleagues, let alone their supervisor. There's no supervision, there's no support. People need to be able to go and talk to somebody and get support and deal with the stresses. And because there's so little support at the moment, a lot of the people who are being recruited to the workforce, right, they're in one, we spent lots of effort on recruitment and they're straight out again. Because when they come up on the reality, they just feel, I mean, why would you do it if you're just left to get on with it? And, um, and yeah. thank can you. I, can I bring in Professor Needham? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the demographic projections are such that we're not going to solve this problem just by training and, and well-paying people to deliver care packages. It's got to come uh, with a really sophisticated approach to prevention um, and to thinking about how we keep people in communities without overloading, uh, very o currently overloaded informal carers. Um, but if people are struggling with loneliness and isolation, then you know we need to find ways to help those people get back to to the church, to the community centre, where there's lots of people who can provide bits of informal support for them and give them what they need in a way which is potentially much more enriching for them than somebody coming in and popping a microwave meal um, in in the, in the microwave and then leaving somebody to eat it by themselves. So I think we need to link this to um, you know thinking much more about how we uh, how we address prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Um, I move on to uh, colleagues who want to ask questions around the projecting of future costs of social care, led by Evelyn Tweed. Evelyn. Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, the Scottish Government has committed to increasing uh, investment in social care by 25% to the end of the life of this Parliament. Um, do you think that we can really consider and project these costs effectively for the future. And to Sir Harry first, please. I'm the wrong person to ask about that. Because, yeah, I would want you to, because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, but there will be all sorts of other demands that need to be balanced. I keep coming back to this £5 billion pounds that's sitting out there that we could be doing something with and saving that would go a long way towards paying for that. Um, so, y yes, it, I mean, in terms of justice, looking after people who need care is an important element, and I would want the Scottish Parliament to be leading the way and doing that kind of thing. But it's someone else has to do the sums. Convener, could I maybe go to Mr Kemp, please? Yes. Um, projecting costs, I think, is very, very difficult um, because of all the factors I've said that don't affect. And, you know, we're, in the moment we've got inflation, you know, which we didn't expect. I mean, so projecting costs is... It's practically Im impossible, but we need to try and do it. Um, that's why I think, actually, what the bill needs to do is to build in a mechanism by which, actually, you can track what's going on in terms of care needs, what's met, what's happening, and the resources that are available for it. And I very much, as I said, welcome central government funding. What there needs to be is a way to have a dialogue with the people delivering the care service, and there is bound to be compromises about that. That's ab absolutely inevitable. But the other thing I would just say is at the moment, we're very much, and this is one of the issues with a rights-based approach, is that we're very much focused on targeting resources at individuals. But if we're going to have the preventative-type infrastructure of clubs that Professor Need mentioned, we need to actually also have a collective approach to care and basically, we need to find a way of empowering local communities to say what are the sort of services and things that they would have in their area that would make a difference. And what I don't see, and there's talk about it, and there's aspirations in the bill for co-design and co-production, but there isn't actually any mechanism at the moment to make that happen. Um, instead, all the discussions going on at the national level, whereas actually what I would like to see is discussions going on at the local level and that feeding up. 
Um, and I want to bring in Professor Glasby before I come back to you, Evelyn. Thank you. Yes, if it's helpful, we can send through um, some long term um, projections that we made uh, in England, taking the uh, scenarios that we used for health service uh, financing by Derek Wanless uh, when, when NHS resources increased so dra dramatically in the the, the, the 2000s. And we applied uh, three similar scenarios to, to future adult social care um, spending. So the methodology may be, may be helpful there. And, um, I suppose these are projections rather than predictions, so, so they help you to plan and to, 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 to think about different scenarios rather than to predict what will actually happen. And, and I think two or three of the um, unanswered questions that remain in lots of attempts to do this are um, where we make hypothetical savings in a system, can we actually disinvest from that uh, service to free up money to invest elsewhere? So often preventative projects will justify their contribution on the number of hospital admissions that they saved. Uh, now, that may well be true, um, but we never get round to closing the bed that that person would have been admitted to. We carry on paying for the bed uh, and we fill it with somebody else. And then we also pay for the preventative project that, that, that was stopping other people being admitted to that, that bed. So in one sense, we pay for it twice. We never quite get round to the stage of disinvesting based on the investment that we've made in in prevention um, and with care related projects what we tend to see as well is that there is um, it's so difficult to access publicly funded social care at the moment and there is so much unmet and undermet need that any attempt to make services uh, better or more outward looking or um, more inclusive or more uh, approachable or easier to understand tends to bring pe more people forward because there's so much unmet need out there. Now, in public policy terms, I would have said that was a good thing because that need is there. It's just hidden at the moment and we might be meeting it better in the way that several witnesses have, have, have spoken about today. But if you're the person responsible for that budget and you think that it's going to go down because you've integrated care and then you suddenly find it's gone up because you've brought forward more unmet need that you didn't even, even know about beforehand, it can be very difficult to manage that individual budget in the short term. And then the final thing I'd say, if it's helpful, is that most of the methodologies uh, tend to focus on service costs when they project forward. They don't think about costs on for people who draw on care and support, for unpaid carers or for communities. And different blends of service or different designs of, of our system have got different implications for what we spend on our public services, but also the contributions that people make directly or in kind if they use as carers or local communities as well. So if we were looking at it in the round, cost of some of our public services might go up, but the, but the negative financial consequences for users, carers and communities might go down, for example, so that the judgment you would make about the effectiveness of that spending might look different if we were looking at things in a holistic way rather than just at um, public money that we spend on public services, which is only one part of the equation. Evelyn. Yeah, that would be really useful if that information could be sent through. Um, yeah, my final question is, in your view, where should the Scottish Government focus its investment in social care? And if I could maybe put that to Professor Needham. Professor Needham. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, we haven't talked much about housing, and I think that's a, a key part of the, the puzzle here, um, that uh, if we're going to meet the need for uh, care and support of people going forward, but also do that in potentially ways that support prevention, then people we need to make sure people are living in appropriate housing, and that's housing that therefore can support uh, people around issues of loneliness and isolation that we know is so so bad for, for people's health and well-being. Um, so I think it's uh, not necessarily thinking about spending the, the social care pound always in, in what looks like social care, but thinking about um, what some of the other kind of forms of support are. Um, obviously, for, for working age people with disabilities, um, then uh, affordable housing is also an issue. Um, and just thinking about making sure that that provision is appropriate. So, um, you know, we know that um, small facilities tend to get 
better outcomes than larger facilities. So uh, I think it's about if we're going to be investing in provision for particularly for older people, let's not build massive care homes that look like travel lodges and feel like, well, maybe at best a travel lodge, but are not places of care and love and joy and support. Let's think about investing in things that feel like community support, that feel like places where people can can call them home. Um, and I think that would be, uh, you know, thinking about care and housing together um, would be a really useful way to think about investment. Thank you. And uh, we'll now go on to um, our next theme, um, which we have dipped into throughout. It's about the, the bill and achieving its policy aims. And I, I, I know we... Oh, apologies. Um, can I just check with Tess White? Tess wanted to ask the question around the financing. Um, thank, thank you, Convener. I think it should be... Yes, thank you, Convener. I think it should be answered if uh, Professor Glassby can share um the the figures that and the report with us so thank you for that thank you very much and apologies again um if i can move on to theme five and about the policy aims and how the, the bill will assist in, in making some headway uh, in those areas and um that's going to be led by paul okay uh, thank you, convener. And yes, I think we've begun to touch uh, on on these areas in terms of what the bill will actually achieve. But I wonder if I can uh, reflect perhaps on some of the commentary that there's been uh, since the publication of the bill. Um, you know, the Centre for Care has said that there has to be greater clarity about how the reforms are going to achieve their goals. And they talk a lot about the theory of change. So how are we testing the theory of change and, and how do we understand whether it will or not have met um, what we're, we're trying to do here? I think there's been commentary around whether it um, will fully deliver feely in terms of the feely review. Uh, and we've also seen commentary from trade unions around whether it will do anything to tackle issues around pay, terms and conditions. Indeed, Eunice never got as far as to say we should have a pause with the bill. So I'm really keen to, to get a sense of, in that context, um, you know, how, how can the bill achieve the aims that, that are set out? And I wonder if we can start with Nick, just to get some clarity on his thoughts. Right, well, I, I think the bill has quite a limited purpose, as I understand it, which is focused on services, on the quality and consistency of services, right, rather than like, what, what's not done. And I think care is wider than that, right? It's wider than just services, as, as we've explained. So I think that, that's one limitation. But in terms of actually what it's going to do, in terms of, and I have answered question about quality before, about workers having time, but I think it's reflect, worth reflecting a bit about consistency. There's a lot of talk about a postcode lottery, and we know, like, in terms of the benefit system, that everybody thinks their neighbour's getting lots of money, but actually there's very strict rules about the benefit system, and, and, and actually most of the time that's not the case. Most people haven't got very much. And we also know that in terms of consistency, in terms of centralised control, managing it, that there's lots of inconsistency in the NHS. There are stories every few weeks about one health board doing one thing and not another. But I think the real problem is that until we've got, and it comes back to the data, that unless there is a mechanism where we can actually collect information on, uh, on unmet need and so on, um, and who's doing what in terms of what, what informal carers are doing, we can't actually tell, we're not going to be able to tell whether the care service is going to be able to, is going to improve consistency or not. So I would see resource allocation as being absolutely key to that. And um, I think a couple of uh, other, other points about that, if you get the resource allocation right, it then allows for local diversity because people can actually, and there needs to be some forms of accountability, can design different types of services for different areas. Because what you need, we shouldn't be measuring consistency in terms of what a service looks like. There isn't a one size fit. It's all, it's quite obvious that services need to look very different in rural areas to, to urban areas. I wonder if um, Sir Harry might comment, particularly in terms of that test of change. I mean, obviously, you've had experience of testing change and, and seeing what works. So, yeah. I mean, if you, if you do what is traditionally been done, which is come up with a bill with targets and indicators and structures and all that kind of stuff, then everyone will put their effort into the targets, you know, ticking the boxes. 
what we're talking about here is enhancing well-being of people who are struggling. And you're absolutely right. The data is crucial to all of this. Um, and, you know, normally I would say that for most of the population, things like health service data and a range of other social determinants of, of well-being could be brought together for elderly people for, for families that would work but for care of the elderly um, it's a bit harder uh, to work out what data would be necessary because you expect the elderly to need a bit of hospital care perhaps and this is this is an area where I think GPs are going to be quite important. You know, how much effort GPs are putting into their elderly population and so on. And it might be that we have to come up with a different data set for, for care of the elderly. Um, but I, I come back to the fact that what we're talking about here is support for our fellow citizens and enhancing their sense of well-being and their sense of being loved and cared for. That's that's what this is all about, really. And uh, I don't think the NHS connect, collects data on how much people feel loved, to be honest. Uh, but um, you're right, we, we need to be thinking about a way in which we can enhance the ability of frontline staff to support individuals and that question, what matters to you, let me help you achieve that, is the critical thing in all of this. Can we bring in uh, Professor Glasby? Thank you, yes. Um, yes, I always get slightly nervous when I, when I hear a debate about consistency versus uh, postcode lottery. Um, in, in the health service, we uh, uh, equity and equality is such a, a key principle. But we, we tend to interpret that as meaning that uh, you should treat everybody the same. And um, um, if people don't start off equal, people or communities don't start off equal, and, and at best all you do is treat everybody the same, that then at best all you do is perpetuate the existing inequalities. And if you don't quite design your services in the right way, you can end up making some of those inequalities worse. Uh, so I wonder whether we're talking about um, equality of, of outcome rather than equality of input, um, necessarily services being the same elsewhere. And if we were clear about the outcomes that we were trying to achieve, and we were clear on the uh, joint amount of money that was available to spend to meet those outcomes, then we could design approaches and services and supports in our local areas that would work best for our local communities, co-producing that with local people uh, and involving uh, frontline staff centrally in, those, in, in that design. So, if I were a director and you gave me a series of outcomes to achieve and an amount of money to achieve those outcomes with, and then left me with the autonomy to to work out how best to use that money to, to, to move towards those outcomes, that would feel uh, the best balance in terms of the local and the, and, and the national. Um, if it descended into a Council A has got a such and such a service. You need to have a such and such a service. But then, then I think we've um, we started to over prescribe a top down sort of apparent solution that might look big and look bold, but, but could actually be a distraction for for meeting the uh, uh, the, the nature of local needs. I wonder if I just yeah yeah follow up because that that leads me neatly on to I, I think the sense I'm getting from those contributions is that this has to be about cultures and not structures. Um, but also, I think that we have to avoid that sort of that top-down approach. Indeed, Reform Scotland uh, said in, in one of their submissions that there's not been an adequate explanation of why simply removing local government, for example, from social care would actually lead to implementation of uh, or innovation in delivery. So, uh, you know, would, would, would panelists agree that we do need to look at that in a in a more rounded fashion? Um, 
think it's worth just saying too here about children's services, right? Where we're talking about improving care services, at the moment it's not clear where the children's services are in. But as soon as you put children's services in, of course, there's all these talks. And I think it was John said about fragmentation as or integration, you know, that are the two sides. Well, you've then got a whole lot of further issues there. So I think actually there needs to be thought about how you embed all of this, how you embed care in local communities, empower professionals to work with each other, and that actually comes before um, uh, uh, top-down structural change. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else wants, wants to come in, but I, I wanted to ask a, a question a, around this, um, and a comparison between the approach of the government in implementing the social security system where they effectively went round the country and spoke to people about experiences of uh, social security and the approach that they're doing now where they've actually got like a national care forum um, it was that the, the, the first of them in, in Perth last month where we've got people from third sector and people who are experiencing social care systems throughout Scotland been involved and how is, is there a comparison that we can draw on the success of that approach with social security to this and how important that, that might be uh, as, as we implement the bill? I, I think they're slightly different because the social security system is on very prescribed rules right which is about how much income people need and their experience of it and what they need but actually it is it is a very centrally driven system whereas actually for designing care services i've said it's just the variation between where you live and so on is it's, it's it just makes a huge difference what communities you're in where you are are there other all it, it, it just totally changes things so trying to design care services nationally uh, to design a system with stakeholders about that could be then applied locally right some to, 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 to set out some rules that could then be applied locally and given to uh, it might be local well, we've only got local authorities at the moment or hscps down to, to then devolve and apply that and come up with services that's one thing but try to get it, it just feels to me at the moment as though it's a one-size-fits-all system. And I don't think that's going to work because care is very different. It's very different to Social Security. Um. I guess. Um, anyone else want to come in on that in terms of the approach about actually going out to people with lived experience? Yeah. Sir Harry. Yeah, I, that term, people with lived experience, is, is extremely prevalent and important when you're discussing early life you know the 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 person who's in jail who's had lived experience of domestic violence and all that kind of thing and hearing from them just how that affected them absolutely changes your view on what they have come through and where they might go in the future um i think that Community is really important in this. When I've seen, um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, conferences I've been at, one in Australia, which looked at, which was a rural health conference in Australia where the communities um, got very much involved in care uh, across the whole system, care for the unemployed, care for the elderly, all that kind of thing. And they came up with really clever innovative solutions to their community um, and I come back to the point that where you see these clever solutions collect the data and scale it up tell other people about it and let them do it and that comes back to the point that we've been making we've been really making which is don't prescribe top-down solutions create an environment where people can develop their own solutions and then share what works. Um, so, yeah, I I I think the role of community in all of this is is very important, and it's something that in when the bill goes through, there should be something said about supporting community development in all of this. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Sandesh, you have a question on this theme? Yes, thank you, convener. Um, and I suppose uh, Professor Glassby would be the person that I'd like to, to ask initially. Um, and Kosler has repeatedly said that improvements to social care need to be made now. Uh, and I heard you say earlier that um, things will likely get worse initially. Um, so these changes will only disrupt these improvements being made. Do you think that more immediate action could be taken to address existing social care issues? And do you think the NCS might jeopardise these changes? Professor Glassby. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so I don't know enough about the situation in, in Scotland, but, but certainly in England, I'm, I'm really worried about the amounts of financial service and, and workforce pressure that the social care system is experiencing at the moment and was experiencing um, prior to COVID and prior to the current cost of living crisis. So, so I am really worried that without some urgent stabilisation uh, uh, and injection of funding uh, and a further reform, that elements of the social care system um, in England anyway could, could fall over this winter um, or, or, or soon afterwards. I do think something urgent is needed in the here and now, uh, perhaps to buy the time to, to have the longer term, more fundamental conversations like the conversations that we've been been having uh, today. Uh, so I don't know if that's also true in Scotland, but, but that would be my concern as a private individual in, in England. Uh, when there's major structural change, as I say, the evidence um, suggests that even though the structural change is often designed to try and deliver different outcomes in future, it can become an end in itself rather than a, a means to an end in the short to the medium term. So there's a decline in role clarity, there's a decline in morale, uh, people reapplying for their own jobs or, or, or kind of jockeying for position in a new structure. We're um, harmonising terms and conditions and joining up IT systems and creating new organisational identities and changing the, uh, the letterhead and the signage and, you know, all the things that you have to do when you're creating new machinery and new organisational infrastructures. Uh, but none of those are things that improve outcomes for people who draw on care and support or patients in the short short term. So there is a risk that any major change um, is a bit of a distraction from the day job in, in the nicest possible way. And that's inevitable with any major change. I'm not saying we should never have a major change, otherwise nothing would ever change. It's just that we need to be ready for the extent of the disruption uh, that, that the relatively long a period of time over which that disruption can last uh, and that we need to be sure that the outcomes that we're trying to achieve are really worth it for the uh, for the upheaval that there will be on route. Uh, at a more local level, I'm guessing there are people on the panel who've experienced a previous merger of a health and social care organisation or maybe two health um, organisations previously and you can sometimes still see some of the neg negative after effects of that merger know, five, ten years after the, the actual change has taken place. It could still have been the right thing to do at the time, but in organisational development terms, you're, you're working with the after effects of the change for many, many years afterwards. So I think for me, those are some of the things to weigh up. What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? Is this definitely the best way of achieving those outcomes? Are we ready for the amount of upheaval that will be en route? And then if social care is, is um, facing similar pressures and um, difficulties in Scotland as it is in England, is there anything that we need to do in the short to, to, to medium term to, to support the sector in the, the here and now, whilst we're also working on those longer term system changes? I could I see Sir Sarhadi nodding along as, as uh, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. Uh, no, just to support Professor Glasby and his comments around amalgamation of health and social care partnerships and uh, different changes to health board structures and so on, it just diverts people away from the job in hand and uh, it takes a while to get over that. So the less upheaval we can get in introducing this and the more consultation with people on the ground and people who are um, receiving care, uh, 
the better and we'll come out with a really good solution and a solution that I think at the end of the day will not cost a fortune you know it will actually may actually save save cost in other sectors thank you we move on to our final theme and that is led by Stephanie Callahan. thank you convener <clears throat> and thanks to the panel for coming along today. Sir Harry, you, you said earlier on, um, very early on, that the critical thing is asking people about what it is that matters to them and actually helping them achieve that. And you've spoken about how that can save and cost down the line there. So I'm wondering, are there any further or what further provisions could the bill include to ensure the focus is on personal centred care rather than based on costs? I don't think you can quite legislate for things like that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking, just as an example, um, the patient safety programme, I have a, f a, a slide uh, from the patient safety programme. Uh, nurses in a ward realised that every day they were writing down aims for the day for, that they wanted to achieve during the day and the doctor would come in and write down for each patient what he wanted to achieve and they realised that nobody was asking the patient what they wanted to achieve and I've got a photograph of this woman in an intensive care ward with a big hairy dog sitting on top of her bed what she wanted to achieve was could she see her pet poodle or whatever it was and you know and that did her sense of well-being and so on, no end of good that couldn't be achieved by any kind of legislation or anything like that. It's a question of just acting. I mean, I, when I worked in intensive care units, if anyone had brought a dog in, matron would have had them hung, drawn and quartered. But the point was, this woman felt so much better because someone asked her. And I've got hundreds of stories of people who've asked for trivial things and it's made them feel much better. So I don't think you can legislate for it. I think it just becomes a habit. You just have folk do it and other folk see the result of it and it spreads. So I think what we have to do, I would suggest that what we did was when the bill comes out, you make it very plain that this is the kind of approach you want to do, a, a kind of supporting people approach. And then we go out, we get the medical organisations, we get the nurse, you know, the Royal College of Nursing and so on, and we make it very plain to them that we want, we, we really want that what matters to you approach to become prevalent across the system. And they'll jump at it. I'd just be interested, convener, in uh, whether or not anybody else feels that there is something that we could include in the bill that would help actually centre that. Any of the others want to contribute? Mr. Kemp. It was mentioned earlier about eligibility criteria, right? I think we would be better getting rid of eligibility criteria, at least in terms of seeing social workers, right? We spend a lot of time doing things. People should be able to go, like they go to a GP and ask for help, right? And, uh, and we need to help people who are asking for it. I mean, that's what person centred care is about. Now, most of the solutions to that will normally not involve money, right? They will involve working with people and the carers to work out what happens. But actually, if we stop trying to pe get, stop people coming through the door, we're just stacking up problems, we're diverting them, we're creating problems elsewhere. So we need to have an open, non, an open door service to start with, which is based in local communities that people can just go and get involved in. Now, the opposite has been happening. You know, since I've been in working, was in, working in social care, all the local offices have closed down, everything's centralised, it's more run. We've now got a community hub in North East Glasgow for 44,000 people, I think it is. I mean, that's not like going to your local GB surgery, it's going totally the other way. I don't know quite what the answer is in terms of the bill, but I think there should be some sort of um, principle of subsidiarity and, and the other point I would just like to make in terms of resources at the moment we tend to the eligibility criteria so you get through and you get X amount of service right 
in fact, some of the best things and, and th the best service I ever commissioned was keeping people in their own homes. It was a block, a tab block in Glasgow with older people there. And we had one man, and it was meant to keep them out of care homes. And it was a 24 hour service with people on alarms, and they would go and see people right, whenever they needed help. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. And there were, I have two stories from that which were brilliant. One was a man with dementia, very challenging behaviour, who I think had actually been chucked out of a care home because they couldn't manage with him. The staff worked with him. This is a relationship-based thing. They discovered he liked swimming. Right? They took, taking this man who'd been violent and stuff down a public swimming pool, right, might seem like a very risky thing. They got him there, and do you know what? All he needed was to go swimming once a week, and all his other problems disappeared. Now, I was the commissioner. I didn't mind we were spending £550 a week, in theory, if we looked at an individual basis, and this is why I don't think we should see things individually, right? We were spending a huge amount of money on it. But actually, we just talked to the provider and they reallocated that resource once they freed it up to people who needed more help. And I also spoke to them about it and they took compromises the whole time because in this tab block, people had alarms, right? And what would happen is, very important, you know, someone, uh, uh, a woman would want help with her nails or her hair, right? And with all these things that are really important to people, and I would ask, what happens when someone goes out the door with dementia wandering and you have to leave them? The alarm goes. And they just said, well, we know the service is there for when we really need it. When we have a real emergency, like if we're on the floor, we know that staff will drop whatever they're doing and come and see us. Now, I think what that illustrates is, and why I think it's so good, everything that Sir Harry has said about local control, right, local decision making, good use of resources, was embedded, it was embedded in those resources. And as a commissioner, I had nothing to do with the overall operation. You know, I asked some questions and it was just sounded brilliant. Can I ask a question, though, around sort of like the ethical commissioning aspect of things? Is that presumably one of the things that the National Care Service Bill wants to do is ensure that there are fair work principles across, you know, there are standards across everything, and that local decision making would still happen, obviously, you know, that that would happen for all the reasons that you've said today, but there would be standards or, in terms of the, the the type of care the, the the standard of care that's been offered to to people but also the the fair work principles and the pay principles and a, and a structure that's akin to that of of the nhs is that really what what is going to underpin all that local decision making i think so and what will basically the structure of ethical commissioning is it says that they will apply the principles in the National Care Service Bill to, to, to practice, right? Now, my view on terms of ethnical commissioning is the fundamental thing about this is, is, and it's in terms of this is for services for people rather than community projects or whatever. It is all about staff. It's what the staff does, right? So it's about paying them properly, seeing they're trained and seeing they get supported and have time to spend with each other. So actually what we do need, and that's what needs to underpin ethical commissioning, is national terms and conditions for all staff. You would have agreed unit costs. So whatever service is getting, you would know how much it would cost to have someone giving, you know, providing X amount of care. It should be the same across the country, whether, whatever sector people should work with. And now that's absolutely fundamental to it. But the other part of what I would say in terms of the costs of ethical commissioning is it has to take account of the difference in costs of providing services. And again, the obvious example is rural areas, right? If someone is having to drive five miles to get to someone rather than walking around the corner, the, the cost of those services, it has to be built in. It's far more exp so. There has to be some discussion about how you do that. Now, I was involved when I worked for Scotland Excel. We did a care cost calculator we developed for care homes, how we could pay a fair cost of care for care home care across the country. It was based on agreed wage policy. You could put whatever wages in you want. You could put training allowances and whatever. You can come up with these unit costs, right? 
it's, an, it's, it's, it's not difficult. We could apply that to every service in the country and it would, it, would, it would be the foundation for resource allocation and so on. You could then give it to local communities and say, the job of commissioners would then get, say, right, well, we've got, you've got so much resource, how do you deploy the staff, talk with the staff on, how do you deploy it in a way to meet Mead in this, in this, this area? Um, I'm going to bring in uh, two uh, of our panellists and then we are going to have to wrap up. I've got Professor Needham's waiting very patiently to come in and then I'm going to bring in uh, <coughs> Professor Glasby. Thank you. I think just on the point of kind of getting voice to the to the front line, um, then when we did our research on care in the Four Nations and we spoke to interviewees working in Scotland, they said just implement the Self-Directed Support Act. Um, so, you know, I, whilst I do agree with the comments of the other panellists that you can't always legislate for this, it is also looking at what's on the statute books and how this new bill can reinforce and reinvigorate that bill rather than necessarily starting again. On ethical commissioning, um, I think there's nine Scottish local authorities that have implemented uh, Unison's ethical care charter. I haven't seen any evaluation of that done by anyone other than Unison, but I think that could be really interesting to, to see how well that's working. Uh, in those that are signatories. Um, and it's also linking the fair work agenda and ethical commissioning to the kind of the, the end goal of people flourishing and having a good life. And so I think that's got to be about making ethical commissioning, commissioning for outcomes. Um, and to do good commissioning for outcomes, you need to have high trust relationships, you need to have flexible services, and you need to have very skilled commissioners. And, and there's something here for me really about how we train and skill commissioners as well as other parts of the social care workforce. Thank you. And uh, finally, I'll bring in Professor Glasby. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree with everything that's just been said. Um, equally, there are some situations, I think, where we, where we need a formal care service for somebody. But, but with the principles of self-direction, there are lots of situations where we might not need anything that looks like a, a formal service at all. And then there's a danger that some of our rules and regulations can become a, a barrier to innovation. So uh, a young person with very complex physical health needs needing to get to school and back each day in England, uh, this situation, uh, the local authority could only achieve that by getting a specially adapted minibus from the day centre. Uh, and so each day, all his friends turned up at school on the school bus, and he turned up on a specially adapted bus, which had the logo of the day centre over the over the door. And it also tied up a specialist vehicle t t twice a day, Monday to Friday, and was really expensive. Uh, with a personal budget, that young man's parents paid some six formers to sit with him on the back of the school bus. Uh, so you could judge the outcome. Did he get to school and back safely each day? Uh, it cost a fraction of what the minibus cost. Uh, it was much more socially inclusive because he was with his friends and, and his peers on the bus rather than in a specially adapted bus segregated from everybody else. Um, but nobody criminal record bureau checked the six formers or, or asked them to register with a, some sort of central register of care workers. They, they let the parents design that sort of very practical everyday solution um, with, a, with a personal budget. So. I agree with what people have said about the, the, the benefits of a national system and the, the scope that that brings to look at terms and conditions uh, and fair work. Equally, there are some situations where, where actually choice and control um, can, can devise solutions that, that don't look like formal care work or formal care services at all. And my fear is that we, by integrating some of our services, we might move towards the more medical model that makes that, that everyday innovation harder because it's even more countercultural in some parts of our health systems that, than it has been in some parts of our social care systems. Thank you. We have actually run over time. I'm going to have to, to move on to our next agenda item, but before I do that, I want to thank all our panellists, both online and in person, for their time this morning. And it's certainly given us a lot of food for thought as we continue our scrutiny of the National Care Service Bill that's before us. Thank you. Right, the third item on our agenda is consideration of four public petitions which have been referred to the committee. And I'll just highlight what they are. It's PE01845. And that is a petition to, uh, agent, for an agency to advocate for the healthcare needs of rural Scotland. 
PE01890, and that is a petition to find solutions to recruitment and training challenges for rural healthcare in Scotland. The third one is PE01915, a petition to reinstate Caithness County Council and Caithness NHS Board. And the fourth one is PE01924, a petition to complete an emergency in-depth review of women's health services in Caithness and Sutherland. Now, the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee has referred the petitions to us um, after they've done their own scrutiny of them, uh, so that they can be considered as part of our work on the health inequalities. If your uh, colleagues will remember that we did a substantial review and uh, inquiry into health inequalities, and a lot of these issues around the, the common theme that going through all these petitions is rural health care, um, which we routinely address in our scrutiny of, of, of health service anyway, and but particularly came up during our health inequalities work. Um, but we do need to have a discussion about what we do with these petitions. Um, some of the petitioners have already uh, um, met, for example, with Cabinet Secretary. I'm talking about the final position there, uh, petition there on the in-depth review of women's health services. Um, and members are aware of the work that the Public Petitions uh, Committee has done. In fact, we've got a member, David Torrance, is on that uh, committee, and he may want to tell us what some of the work that's been, been done. But um, before I open it up to colleagues, I've got some options that we can discuss about what we want to do, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go through each one of them. We could... Uh, although we will not be able to do it this side of Christmas because our scrutiny of the, health, the National Care System uh, Service is taking up all our time right up until Christmas. But we could invite a selection of rural health boards to give it evidence on the issues raised within the petitions and follow this with either a letter to the Cabinet Secretary or a session with the Cabinet Secretary. That's obviously going to take the most time and we need to decide whether or not we do have time for that. The second option... Uh, would be to proceed directly to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care to give evidence on the issues raised within the petitions, given that a lot of evidence has already been taken and we've already done quite a lot of our own scrutiny on rural health care and our equalities work. Um, and I should point out that the Cabinet Secretary actually did go to the Petitions Committee, I believe, um, to talk to, to the, the petitions as well. We could, option three, write to rural health boards and the Cabinet Secretary seeking evidence on the issues and just do it via correspondence. Or we could close all or some of the petitions. So those are the, there's the four options. And uh, I think we should probably go to David because I think it'd be really helpful to hear from David about some of the scrutiny work. And this is, uh, this is not revenge of you actually passing them on to us. I just, I, I just, I, I just genuinely want to know what, what level of, of scrutiny you experienced as a member of that committee and a, of our committee. David. Thank you, Commit. Uh, Convener, I'll remember not to pass any of them on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, some, some of the work that's been done around the, the petitions that are in front of us um, is quite intense. So I'd look at the recommendations. If you maybe write to rural health boards, then bring the Cabinet Secretary in, and I think that would give them justification. There's one there where is um, petition P1915, reinstate Caithness County Council and Caithness NHS Board. I don't think that is practical for us to do. Um, and I don't think it is ever going to happen anyway, so I'd probably close that petition. Yeah, and I, I believe there was only like two, two people in support of that petition, whereas yeah. the other ones were a lot more substantial. And there's quite a lot of overlap between the, the other three petitions in, in particular in terms of the themes. Gillian, that's very helpful. Thanks, David. Thanks, Convener. Could I also support David's... Um, position of of writing to the health board i think the petitioners would probably like to see some action taken on this in the period between now and christmas and i think through correspondence to the health boards to gather that information and then have the cabinet secretary and after christmas actually makes the most of the time we have in in both ways in terms of gathering information while we're doing other things and ensuring that we have that in-person session to make sure we cover the issues that's very helpful. Thanks, Gillian. Sandesh. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I feel that uh, PE 1890 about solutions to recruitment and training challenges for rural healthcare in Scotland, um, this is particularly important because if we look at healthcare, and we look at GPs, for example, it's very difficult to recruit GPs. We know that nursing uh, provision across Scotland is not uniform. Uh, we actually have a significant worse recruitment in rural areas um, than we do in urban areas. Uh, and we, I could go on uh, and make have more and more examples. Um, I do feel that PE 1890 as a petition should be brought in front of a health board and they, that our rural health board should be explaining what they are doing right now and we that would then follow that up with a meeting with the cabinet secretary to find out what is happening centrally but i do feel this is a really important area that unfortunately we we have not got uh, a grasp on yeah uh, but it, i should also mention that we are routinely meeting health boards as well and we can factor quite a lot of the issues from peo uh, 1890 and the other petitions we can fa be factoring that in in our work and we did say um, that we wanted to do some real targeted work on workforce in particular in rural areas and that's why we're having the health boards in so remember that that's the way what I don't want to do is duplicate it and have an additional session but I think that it's I mean gosh you, you're, you're preaching to the converter because I'm a rural MSP and everything you've mentioned is the situation in Aberdeenshire um, but uh, I, th I think um, in terms of sessions, remember we will be having health boards in anyway, so that petition could feed into some of the, the scrutiny that we're doing then as well. So uh, my, my only concern about that is that I feel that there are health boards that do not come in front of us, and there are health boards that, I don't want to use the word hide, um, but I will. Um, and we need to ensure that rural health boards are coming in front of us and we get all health boards in front of us so that we can have this discussion directly because on a session that we had previously, um, the health boards that, that appeared um, were ones that were not under great scrutiny. Uh, and I feel that's really important that we get everyone here. No, I agree with you and that's certainly something that we mentioned in our work programme day as well is we want to be hearing from all health boards and that's something that we're endeavouring to do throughout the year but yeah I, I agree with your point. Any other comments on the, so, uh, an approach to these petitions? Now, David has suggested that we close one, uh, Gillian has suggested that we write to all the rural health boards and have the cabinet secretary in. Um, any other thoughts Carol? I mean, I think I would be supportive of Gillian's position um, to write to the health boards. Then we've got some information that we can look at and then speak to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm also, I, I would tend to feel that we should keep all the petitions open. I don't know if there's MD here who covers the Caithness area. I'm not 100% sure because I would like to just speak to somebody about that. I don't know a lot about it, but it would give me a chance just to refer to somebody that covers that area. And of course, what you could do is you could look at the, the, the outcomes of the petitions yeah. uh, uh, committee, as, yeah. as David has said, if you look at their their recommendations, recommendations. with regards to that. Perfect. Um, yep. And I think that's linked to in your papers. Yeah. Anyone else? Paul? I just... Forgive me, because we, I suppose we've not done this before as a committee, but there's obviously a, an issue in there around local government and, and the structure of the local government. So I wonder if that's actually an issue for the local government committee, um, because we are not, with the best will in the world, going to be able to make yep. a recommendation around the restructuring of local governance in Scotland. Um, it's just a thought, and I'm not sure how the ping pong works in terms of committees, but... Well, it was referred to us, sure. so um, maybe it's best that we don't do much more ping ponging than... <laughs> Pardon that expression. It's already, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's already <laughs> happened. Um, so I think we need to make, make a decision because a, a couple of people, I, I, I certainly would agree with David on closing the petition uh, PE01915 for the reasons that David has set out. And with the other three, keeping them open and using them as a springboard to have that scrutiny of rural health care and addressing all the issues that the petitioners have raised um, and getting the cabinet secretary in and I think Gillian's approach is the one that I favour writing to the rural health boards but in 
having in mind what Sandesh has said, that we need to be hearing from all rural health boards. And when we ask them to come in front of the committee, it should not be the same ones that come in front of us. It should be all of them. And I think there's, you know, we can't, we, can, we, we, we can't compel people to come in front of us, but I think that everyone should take the opportunity to talk about what they're doing to address these issues. Sandesh. I wonder if uh, we might need to publicly say who we've invited and who have declined our invitation. I think that's all on public record anyway, is it not? Yeah. Okay, well we can talk about that in, in, in private session, but are we agreed to Gillian's approach? Because I think that I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense that To Gillian and David's approach. <laughs> there you go. Ownership. Co-ownership. Co okay, thank you very much, colleagues. So that um, uh, concludes the public part of our, of our meeting today. Uh, so we'll go into private session.